Oh, great. Hi, uh, Noreen Karashiwala in PHND. Um, I, I really wanted to, to thank the panel for this really interesting presentation. And the, the keynote was particularly interesting for me as one who doesn't know very much about this region of the world. I think I'm not alone here. Um, and I, I was thinking about uh, how this related to some of the work that my colleague Giordano Poloni and I have been doing on structural transformation uh, in East Asia. And so what we, what we find is that um, there are also these patterns of declining employment in agriculture and increasing incomes and kind of looking at uh, where their employment is going, but also what is driving it. And what's driving it in, this, in the context in which we're looking at it is, is investments in human capital and education. And I wonder to what extent that played a role um, in, in the countries in your context. Thank you. And I, and I was remiss, I, I should have asked you to introduce yourselves as you ask your questions. I, so, and then, so to Karen. Karen Brooks, formerly of IFPRI and formerly of the World Bank, and delighted to be here. Um, thanks to all of you for um, really interesting presentations and, and useful insights. I was surprised that I didn't see you in your top 10 policy recommendations anything about agricultural science and investment in agricultural science. Um, ordinarily, um, <laughs> this would get attention, and I think it's probably very much needed in, in Central Asia. And I think it also maybe brings in the, the possibility to relook at some of the alliances and, and connections within the region, because I would guess that there's good agricultural science across the border in China that might be quite, quite relevant to um, the issues that Central Asian countries are facing, and I wonder if some of those new connections might be um, worth thinking about, um, even given the historical um, you know, background and the, the history that, that links these countries together. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Cedic from FAO. And um, I have a question for, for Yo, because the uh, title of the policy seminar is Agricultural and Food Systems Transformation for Better Food Security and Nutrition in Eurasia. And I was wondering, uh, how uh, do you see that the transformation of the agricultural and food system has actually improved nutrition and food security? Because in a lot of ways, nutrition has gotten worse with the rise of obesity in this region. And in some ways, you can say better food security is not def definitely be because of the transformation of the food system, but for other reasons, I mean, income's going up. So I, I wonder how you see the role of the transformation in bettering food security and nutrition in Eurasia. All right, great. The only remark I'll make is just looking at positive income shocks. We're simultaneously in Kyrgyzstan looking at 11 years of data. We simultaneously see improvements in child's nutrition, nutritional status and rising rates of overweight and obesity. So definitely, um, seeing income increases leading to, to okay. those two okay. problems, okay. or one problem and one good thing. Great. <laughs> okay. And about drivers of uh, structural transformation, and actually structural transformation is happening in Central Asia, but not fast, not like in East Asia or Southeast Asia. And actually, if you look at the data, you observe some disbalance in structural transformation, in the changing in the share of uh, uh, employment in agriculture and the share of income in agriculture. For example, in Kazakhstan, you see that huge disbalance, actually. Agriculture provides less than 5% of GDP, but about 25% of uh, labor still in agriculture. That's because of oil. And you see this similar uh, pattern in other countries of the region. Uh, about this, uh, that question was about for you, but uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> about the nutrition, uh, yes, actually, changing, yeah, we're working on that topic, particularly changing food systems or evolving food systems in the region. And you can see that's happening, actually, overweight and obesity is happening uh, or becoming important problem in the region now, and especially in countries of, uh, like Kazakhstan. You, you see that in the picture, actually, uh, structure or composition of food consumption is changing or changes significantly. More than 65% of uh, ener uh, energy intake is c coming from uh, non-staples uh, at the moment. But 
most of this went to energy drivers like uh, oil and sugar. So actually, uh, our research at the household level, not from Kazakhstan, but from other countries of the region shows actually that fat consumption and sugar consumption closely related with uh, rising obesity and overweight. Over to you. Do you want to add anything, Simon? Thank you. No, not in form of um, answering any question, but actually, um, I want to talk to the instrument that uh, you know the World Bank is using to be able to work on this particular topic, which I thought is quite uh, very relevant. Um, so this is the case where uh, Russia, you know, work with the World Bank. They are paying for the services, and they are interested to you know to study those policy questions. So what that means is that um, at the end of the day, uh, they would like to see some results, good result, policy relevant result that can actually be a, an, an incentive for you know more of this kind of product. Because if we, we do not come out with some policy relevant question ap applicable to the countries, I, I think we, we reduce the chance of getting this kind of support. So I just wanted to raise awareness about that and, and, and make sure that uh, we uh, actually respond to the key question that the, the countries are looking for. And on, on this question, I, I just want to side, uh, uh, piggyback on what Karen Brooks has said. A few weeks ago, we had the Deputy Prime Minister of Kazakhstan at the World Bank, exactly talking about agriculture. And then when we gave the example of what uh, Brazil did with Embrapa and so on, he was so impressed that immediately he asked his, his team to travel to Brazil to understand that you know, process. So the, and, and all what we said was about what support that Brazil provided to uh, research, education, agriculture for many years that led to the transformation of agriculture, the agricultural landscape in Brazil to become you know, one of the global food players. You know? So, so if we, a strategy has that potential, so the, 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 what we can bring, uh, we World Bank, I think, is the experience of this kind of country like Brazil, you know, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, India, what they have done, China, for example, you know, and how they can learn from that. For example, they are looking, Kazakhstan is interested in China a lot. They really want to see what's happening there. So we can bring this kind of, uh, you know, experiences to play and bear on what they want to do. So I just wanted to mention that, mm -hmm. to say that uh, we, let's okay. talk and make sure that we discuss very applied policy relevant issues that can help transform the food system in those countries. Great. Thanks. I think uh, the, the question, uh, I think David uh, raised, uh, did, uh, did transformation really improve food security and nutrition? I think uh, um, just by understanding what transformation has been uh, is, is, I think, a great contribution of this, uh, of this report because um, uh, we are we're looking at the, uh, uh, we, we were trying to look at the, like going into the minds of policymakers and see how they are influencing agricultural policies, how they are driving uh, um, de development into one or the other direction, and this is a this is a great contribution that that could also lead to also understanding what 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 impacts it had on food security and nutrition indicators. We didn't have time, right, you know, to look at the actual outcomes of the of the policies, but uh, but we we tried to really map uh, map the, the the process of agricultural transformation in mm -hmm. this report. Good. Great, thanks. Okay, now to over to you, Yo. For... Um, uh, actually, I should apologize. I had no idea. I thought I had much more time than I was uh, uh, assigned on the latest program. Um, in any, actually, I can do it easy now. I can say, like, thank you very much for the comments. These were great questions, and uh, because they're difficult. Let me just say, Karen, yes, your point's absolutely true, okay? And so uh, it should have been on there. So I'll make it number 11 as soon as I get <laughs> to my uh, room. <laughs> yes, number one. And definitely the link with China is uh, very important, I think, you know, the One Belt Road Initiative. I mean, China is very active in the region, and so the research and sciences initiatives, I think, would fit in well there. In terms of the first question related to human capital and education, 
and this relates a little bit to David's question as well. The, you know, these countries have a very particular history if you compare it to countries like in Africa or East Asia, so because they had fairly high levels of standards in terms of human capital, education, etc. in the 1980s, also in terms of basic food consumption. I mean, they had usually subsidized food. They had uh, <clears throat> also in health uh, services, etc. Um, and so the transition, and, and that makes the, the situation in Eastern Europe so different from what's happened in Central Asia. I mean, Eastern Europe thinks they've gone through a bad period, but on average now they're much better off than they used to be, okay? And as uh, David rightly pointed out, okay, that's not obvious if you look at this part of the world, whether they're actually so much better off or even worse off than before. Now, David, you spent 25 years of your life probably thinking about the question you just asked me, right? And so... <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, <clears throat> it's, as I said, okay, I think in, in Central and Eastern Europe, I mean, the answer is, yes, they're better off. They're definitely better off. And there's still a lot of, there's considered poverty in society and whatever. And to some extent, these people are suffering, which may not, I mean, they may have been taken better care of under the previous system. I think in that, <clears throat> also look at, if you look at Belarus, there's a couple of countries which have hardly reformed, okay, still now, which is uh, Belarus and Turkmenistan, and their official numbers are actually better than the other countries. The problem there is, like in the old system, what are the numbers worth, okay? Is the government making, making them up, or are they re uh, representing the actual situation? I think the obesity growth is... <clears throat> If you compare it with the situation of 15 years ago, it's kind of, it fits in the, in the global pattern. Is this good or bad? <laughs> I, I don't think you can answer that yet. No, it's not good because the obesity increases, but it's what happens in all countries in the world. So the question is, could have done better growing without obesity increases, I think. Okay. I know this is not an answer to your question, <laughs> but uh, it, it's hard. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you again very much to, the, to Yo and to the panelists. Thank you.